everyone. Long time, no stream. It's been a few months since I've streamed and super excited to get back on YouTube, get back creating content and talk a little bit about the changes I've made to my personal website. So thank you all for joining in live today. Uh, for everybody joining, hey, glad to glad to see y'all here. I see we've got some excited people in the chat. So thank you for joining. Um, hey, hey, hey. Hey, Brian. Awesome. Well, I will kick things off in the stream today. Basically, I'm going to walk through some of the changes I've made. Uh, I'm going to leave time for questions at the end where you can grill me on anything about Next.js or Prisma or PlanetScale or my website and make sure that we have time to answer all the questions that you have. Um, lots of people saying hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is going to be fun. We're just going to we're going to keep this pretty light and uh, conversational. So feel free to ask any questions. So let's let's pull up some code. Let's uh, let's share my screen and just dive right in. I will do that now. So I, I have my repo opened on the left here, LeeRob.io, and I also have my website on the right. First things first, before we talk about the code, I'll just quickly explain some of the changes I've made and I guess why I've made the changes I've made. So probably about a month ago, I redi redesigned my site and I wanted to update some of the tech that I was using because I like to experiment and try out things when I have a good understanding of them that I feel a lot more confident recommending them. And a few people had um, taken inspiration from my site's design. So I wanted to kind of give it a give it a fresh coat of paint and make it look uh, a little fancier. So I've redesigned the site with still using Tailwind CSS for all my styling. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I put some of my videos directly on the screen with some nice little animations here. And I know previously my site had just a complete ba uh, black background for dark mode. And I've switched that up a little bit to, to make it a little more, a little more appealing. I uh, still have my guest book where you can go sign and leave comments and uh, the dashboard that uses Next.js API routes shows my top tracks from Spotify. And I slightly redesigned my blog as well too. So it looks just a little bit different. The major thing you'll notice is that I'm using a different font. So I actually pulled for IBM Plex instead of Enter, which I've been using just to kind of switch things up. I've been using Enter for most of my sites and it was nice to kind of just give it a little tweak, uh, switch up the design just a bit. And this still has the embedded tweets and, and everything else that makes it a good blogging experience. Um, so when I migrated from Firebase and Redis over to PlanetScale, I wrote this blog post that you can go check out on my site. And it kind of talks about some of the underlying reasons for doing this. Uh, mostly, I wanted to get a little bit closer to using SQL. And I moved from, essentially, I was using Firebase and Redis just to experiment and learn new things. So I wanted to do that again and experiment with Planet Scale. And in the process of doing that, I essentially, one, learned more SQL, which is fun. There's always new stuff to learn with SQL. And two, uh, got to understand kind of how to migrate data out of one system and into another to get it on my site. So for example, I was doing real-time blog post views and I was able to kind of export that JSON, write a little script that I could then upload all of that data into my SQL database with PlanetScale. I did the same thing with Redis too, just using HVALs to actually get all the content out. And yeah. Um, here are the scripts, by the way, if you're if you're curious on how I migrated that content. But that allowed me to get to this, which is this is my my current planet scale schema that I've landed on. So today, now that I've made these changes, I wanted to take an opportunity to 
kind of step back, talk about how this works in my repository and why I've also started to use Prisma as well. So I'm going to pull my code over here and make it a little bit larger. Oh, there's also that nice animation on the mobile menu. So in my repository, lerob.io, the code is public on GitHub if you want to go check it out. Um, let me know if the, the font is good enough. Uh, inside of here, in my root repository, I have a Prisma folder. And this Prisma folder defines the schema for my database. Now, I wanted to use Prisma because it allows me to still use PlanetScale or really any database of my choice and give me nice type safe access to call my database, add data, delete data. And I also like that for people jumping into my code from an open source perspective, it's really clear what the schema is for all of the different tables that I'm using. So when they clone this, it's easier for them to understand, okay, here's what's going on. It's you know defined as code, it's codified in my repository. So on my site, there's really two main things that I'm using a database for, and I'm using Prisma and PlanetScale for, and that is for my guestbook and for tracking blog post views. So on the right, you see I have these blog post view counters for each post, and that table is pretty simple. It is just a slug of the post and what the count is. So a string slug and some count. And I also have the guest book. And this is a little more complex, but when somebody logs in using next off, that's another change that I made. I was previously doing uh, custom GitHub OAuth, and I moved to use the next auth package because it really simplifies a lot of this. So when someone logs in with next auth and they're authenticated, they're able to sign my guest book. And when they click sign, it adds information to the database with this model. So their name, their email, what they said, and then some tracking for the time. So the great thing about Prisma is that if for some reason I wanted to change my database, there's that layer of abstraction there, which allows me to port between different providers if I wanted to. Right now, I'm really happy with PlanetScale, and I don't necessarily need to do that. But for from an open source perspective, that's really nice if somebody wants to clone my repo and maybe they're already using Prisma somewhere else. It gives that flexibility. Now, PlanetScale really plays in very nicely with Prisma. There's a couple flags that you can use here to make them work together very smoothly. But essentially, it gives you all the benefits of having a really fast, really scalable MySQL database while still having this type safe client that you're probably familiar with. So previously, I was just using raw SQL queries essentially with plant scale. And this gave me a little bit more flexibility on top with that. By the way, I see everyone's comments. I'm not, I'm not ignoring y'all. I'll, I'll periodically stop to, to answer some comments and make sure we have time at the end as well too. Um, so let's let's talk about let's talk about the guest book first. I think that could be really interesting. So inside of my pages folder, I have this API folder for my API routes, and I have off. And inside of here, I have next off as a catch all route. So this dot 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 next off, and what that essentially does is it next off the library creates multiple API routes for signing up signing out. And essentially, it, it's like a plugin for Next.js. I don't have to configure all of those API routes myself. The library does that for me. So with Next Auth, it's super easy to hook up any auth provider. In this instance, I'm using the GitHub provider. And I pass in a client key and a client secret that you can obtain on GitHub. You can go check out the docs if you want to see that, the Next Auth docs. And that's literally all the code that you need to do authentication. So it really simplifies that process. So I've signed in. Uh, I have a guestbook component here. And let's see, I have this button right here, which is I want to sign in. I click sign in and this goes. What's this at? 
Oh yeah. It directly navigates to the API route that we created through next auth. So slash API slash auth slash sign in slash the provider of GitHub. And then on the client side, it uses the sign in method that next auth exports along with the provider. So that's included here. So I sign in, I type in some message and I hit sign and you'll see that I have right here, I have leave entry. And this function essentially calls an API around my application slash API slash guestbook forwards a body of whatever the person typed in. And if there was an error, it will show an error. Otherwise it clears out the input and updates the form. So let's dive into this guestbook. I type something in and I send it to API guestbook. What does that, what does that look like? So pages slash API slash guestbook. This is where we start to get into the Prisma and planet scale code. So when I navigate to slash API slash guestbook, the index route, so here's my directory structure. It basically checks, okay, let's go to Prisma. Let's do our guestbook model. And we're going to find all of the entries that are ordered by when they were updated. And then we have this entire list of every entry of people who have commented on our guestbook. If we're doing a Git request to this API route, we can just return all those entries. So when I go to lerod.io slash guestbook, that's what's happening here. We're getting all the different entries from our database and we're ordering them by when they commented, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. But then if I go down a little bit further, this is where it starts to get interesting. I'm able to get the session of the user through next auth. So it exports this function get session. And based on that request, I can determine if the user's logged in. So I can get their email and their name. If there's no session, then they're unauthorized. They're trying to hit this route when they haven't already logged in. And this is, you know, checking a cookie. And if they are logged in and I'm doing a post, which is the code that I just showed from the guestbook component, this post here denoted by the uh, denoted by the method, then I can actually create this entry inside of Prisma. So one of the cool things about Prisma is that when you're typing Prisma dot because of TypeScript, it's able to show the different tables in my schema. So it knows that I have a guestbook table. It knows that I have a views table, which is really handy. This is part of the reason why I switched to TypeScript, which we can talk a little bit about that as well too. So on my guestbook table, I want to create, so pretty, pretty straightforward named API methods, which is good. And then I want to forward some data. So what data do I actually want to save? And I have an email, I have a body, and I have created by. Now, what if I what if I messed this up? Like, what if I typed this wrong? This is where TypeScript is actually super nice. And I'm I'm converting over, okay? I'm, I'm moving from JavaScript to TypeScript because I get these nice squiggly lines that tell me that, hey, created Y is actually not available on my database. So it's able to understand based on my Prisma schema, when it generates this TypeScript client, it already knows all of these things. And the big benefit here is reducing that feedback loop and getting it as close to your development cycle as process. I wanna know in my IDE if I've made an error rather than waiting until I've already deployed my code and now my site is blowing up. So that really helps a lot. So we save off the email of the body and when it was created, and then we can return that response back to the client side so that we can immediately show this value. So let's take a look at planet scale as well as Prisma. So this guestbook table, what does this actually look like inside planet scale? Inside the application here, I have my, my dashboard. You can see all the different activity on my database. And there's a few different options here, deploy requests, branches, and getting into settings if we would like. But if I go look at my historic deploy requests, you can see when I've actually made updates to the schema. So my schema defined here 
if I want to make some change to this, I can essentially run a schema migration, open a deploy request, which is the database equivalent of a pull request on GitHub, and actually run that migration against my database. So in the past, this was something that was kind of difficult for me. Like coming from the front end space, I didn't have a great grasp on setting up database migrations myself. Uh, you know, previously at companies I worked at, the, the backend engineers had already set all that up. So building that out myself, uh, it, was, it was really nice to have tools like PlanetScale and Prisma, when in combination they make this much more accessible for front end developers like myself. So we can look at this deploy request, for example, I added this guestbook table. We can see the diff of what we've added. And I essentially deployed this to my production database. It ran the migration. And then now I have this guestbook table that's ready. Um, and I can actually look and introspect my data inside of PlanetScale if I wanted to look at the contents of my database. But another cool thing too is the Prisma data proxy or the Prisma Cloud product where I can also do this. Um, the Prisma Cloud or Prisma Data Proxy product essentially exposes an API for my database to hit. So I can use this through Prisma to do the same operations that I'm doing through PlantScale. And as you can see here in this data browser, I can see all of the different views for my views table. And I could also you know, actually query data inside here programmatically if I wanted to, let's say, you know, find uh, let's find all of the entries in the guestbook. It's kind of nice how this is automatically pre-populated with all of the different content. I can try to make this a little bit bigger. But yeah, so I ran find many here and then it showed up all the different responses. So a nice little way to understand what data is in my database and without having to do this locally, you know, I'm a, I'm a true front-end developer where I, I prefer the UI over the CLI. Uh, I know not everyone is that way, but I do, I do love me some UI. So I definitely enjoy this explorer where I can kind of dive into my data. So that's, that's PlanetScale, that's Prisma. Let's also look at views. I want to check out some of this code too. So inside of API, I have a views folder. And there's a lot of similarities here, a lot of similar ideas. Um, I'm doing some cool stuff with Prisma though. So inside of the index route for views, I can do prisma.views.aggregate. So given all of the different entries on my views table, I want to sum them all up based on the property of count. So on my website, when I go to my dashboard and I have the all time views here, this is actually the summation of every entry inside of that table, which is kind of nice. And essentially I take that value, I can make it into a string and return it back from my API route. But what about when I wanna add an entry? Again, Prisma makes this pretty straightforward to update the data in my planet scale database by using an upsert. So the difference between kind of an insert or an upsert is an upsert means that it could already exist. So if I've already viewed this blog post for the first time, we're actually updating that content. If I haven't viewed it, then this is the first time. So we'll insert it new. So the upsert method allows me to say, given a certain slug, just to demonstrate this, I'll pull up my blog and I'll find I'll find one here. So given this slug of head of DevRel has 4,996 views, somebody just viewed it. Um, given that slug, we want to either create a new entry at that slug or update the count and increment it by one. So it's it's nice that essentially Prisma gives you the entire API to do this stuff. I don't have to do any raw SQL, but we can talk about this more. If, if you really want to, you can still do raw SQL queries. So you're not that far away from the raw database work. And you can also output what the underlying query that this generates is, if you would like. 
So I've been talking for probably about 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I'm going to pause to see what some of the questions are in here. Yeah, Prisma essentially is like TypeScript for SQL. It's probably the easiest way I've found to work with databases, especially as a front-end engineer. And Planet Scale is handling that cloud-hosted uh, SQL database for me. Um, yep, I'm using Planet Scale, and I will talk about Content Layer here in a second. Um, would definitely recommend checking out Planet Scale if you want to do a SQL database. If you're looking for Mongo, um, Prisma also supports Mongo too, so you can you can check that out as well. Um, yeah. TypeScript is chef's kiss. It's it's growing more on me every day now that I've started to see more of the benefits. Part of part of what I like to do with my personal site is experiment, try out new things and understand what works and what doesn't work. So when I talk to people in the community, when I do these live streams, I can give you know accurate opinions and uh, feedback on how things work. Some people think TypeScript is the future. Uh, let's see. Yes, we hired the creator of NextAuth, and he is amazing. Uh, let's see. There's a bunch more questions in here. <laughs> Mahmood is in the chat. Plant Scale and Prisma are an epic combo. Yes, yes, they are. I can also get into talking about code blocks as well too. So I'll add that to my list to talk about um, plant scale and Superbase. So plant scale is specifically for MySQL and Superbase is for uh, Postgres or Postgres. That's probably one of the main differences. They're both really great. Yeah, I have a snippet section too with some code snippets if you wanna, if you wanna check that out. Um, I hope everyone's having fun on the stream. Feel free to drop any questions in the chat. I'll be I'll be hanging out and having fun. And yeah, thanks for joining. Okay, so let's let's look at some more code. Um, we talked a little bit about Prisma. Talked a little bit about Planet Scale. One of the things I wanted to talk about too is how we can solve connection pooling. Um, I have a tweet thread about this um, that I'll drop in the chat if you want to check it out. But what's really neat is the Prisma Data Proxy and Planet Scale are two great solutions for this where, you know, in the past you had your node server, you'd make a bunch of requests to it. Each request would open up a connection to the database. But then there was this connection pooling problem that some of you are probably familiar with where you had to pool those together to make an active connection to the database so you didn't exhaust the number of connections that you could have. Now, once people started adopting these serverless architectures, the traditional way we had relational databases built, it didn't really work well with this. So each function would be trying to open a connection to a database. And if you got a lot of traffic, this could end in kind of poorly or you would exhaust all of those connections. So the great thing is we now have some excellent solutions for this, which just utilize HTTP and exposing APIs. So in the example of a Prisma data proxy or a Supabase, they're exposing these essentially data APIs or API gateways to our database, where you can execute your code without managing connections. And with, with plant scale specifically, the underlying technology they use called the test is actually just so good that it can handle a ridiculous amount of connections to the point where it's not usually a problem. So that's pretty fascinating as well, too. So I'd recommend uh, checking all that out, learning a little bit more about Postgres if you're on the Postgres world, too. But yeah, lots and lots of good stuff there. Let's talk a little bit about content layer and why I'm checking this out and why I'm exploring uh, how I'm doing my content. So in my past stream, I did a pretty deep dive on how I wrote MBX in my blog, which I still have a lot of MBX files. And at the time I was using um, Next MDX Remote, which allows you to just fetch remote MDX from somewhere. 
And that library is great, but I've ended up moving to a tool called Content Layer uh, to try this out because it, again, it's kind of like a Prisma or a TypeScript solution for fetching your data. And it simplifies a little bit of the setup to actually fetch the MDX in your repository. So I have this data folder and I have a blog nested below it with all my different blog posts that are using Markdown with some front matter. And some of them have components inside of here as well. I have the same thing for a newsletter with a bunch of newsletters and a bunch of code snippets too. Um, so if you go to lerob.io slash snippets, there's some interesting code snippets that I find. And I just, this is essentially like my public bookmarks where if I find some cool stuff like, oh, how to do a gradient border with CSS, I kind of just catalog them here to have. So I have all these, all of this data as MDX files in a data folder. And because it's not in the pages folder, we have to tell Next.js, hey, how do I actually fetch this data? And that's one of the big advantages of Next.js, in my opinion, is that it doesn't really care where your data is at. It could be anywhere. And it gives you this API of get static paths and get static props that allow you to define how you fetch that data. So specifically, this route is my blog posts, blog slash slug. And this slug is a dynamic route, meaning if I go to lerob.io slash blog slash Let's see, MySQL planet scale is what this one is. That will be the slug value in this component. So we go into get static props. We say, hey, we have all of our blogs. Find the one that matches that slug out of all the blogs that we have. And then specifically, I'm also doing a little fun stuff here with fetching the tweets that I might mention in a blog post to kind of statically embed them like this, which is a nice little, nice little bonus on there. But this all blogs, what is what is this thing? I'm using it here too. I have get static paths where I say, take every single blog and give me the slug and then return an array of all of those. So Next.js knows, hey, here's all the different blogs that I have available. But again, where is this all blogs thing? And all blogs comes from content layer. So content layer is still under development right now. It's in alpha. But I'm trying it out because it allows you to use MDX or CMS content in your, in your repository and in your app. Um, so I can put a link to this in the description afterwards, or you can just go to content layer dev on, on GitHub. And you see I have content layer slash data. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at what this is. And this is actually auto-generated based on the content of my content layer file. So you're thinking, okay, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Bear with me. So all of this stuff is essentially similar to a Prisma client where it just gets auto-generated based on your schema. So if I go back to my repository and in the root, I have this content layer config file. Now this is the secret sauce. This is what defines basically everything about my repository. I don't have to do any manual markdown parsing. I don't have to do any manual MDX setup. It kind of stitches all this stuff together for me. And this entire file is maybe like a hundred lines. So let's, let's step through some of this starting down at the bottom. This is where I'm making the source of my content. And that's what this make source function does. So I'm gonna say, hey, in my data folder, I have a couple different types Notice I'm using TypeScript. I have a couple different types of content. I have a blog, I have a newsletter, I have snippets. So let's define the document types for this as our schema. So for blog, for example, I defined this type, a name of blog, specifically which files to look for, and then different fields on it. And again, we define the type of these and whether they're required or not. So really getting strict on that typing. This is from the... Uh, this can be parts then from the markdown front matter. And we also have computed fields too. Same exact thing for a newsletter or a snippet or other pages. And I can differ the different fields that I have available and the location of that file. So I have all these different types, right? 
I go in here and then I'm saying, all right, I want to use MBX. And we're going, when we parse that content, we're going to augment it with some different plugins. So specifically, I want to use GitHub flavored markdown. There's some intricate details between normal markdown and GitHub flavored markdown. So I've, I've been using that just for compatibility. I want to, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the slug plugin does. Oh yeah. Look at that. <laughs> the popover tells me what it does. Uh, plug in to add IDs to all my headings. So if you notice over here on the right, if I click this heading, it actually makes it sticky and it adds it to my URL. So I can send a link directly to this section. Uh, code titles. This is a fun one. I love the code titles plugin. I believe I'm using that. Where am I using that? Where am I using that? I'll find one. Hmm. I think I'm, I'm in here. Yeah, here we go. So it's a, just a little bit better designed way of saying, hey, the code you're looking at right here is for package.json. And this one's for learna.json, for example. Uh, Prism is for syntax highlighting. That's major key. And also auto-linking headings, which relates to the, the slugified. So this is all that it takes for content layer to say, hey, parse this data folder and essentially spit out the type safe client to access my data. Um, I, these computed fields, which I mentioned before, allow me to add extra stuff as well too. So I have uh, the word count that I'm using a NPM library for. And I have a read or sorry, reading time is the one I'm using the NPM library for word count, which is just looking at the length of the content, uh, the tweets I'm parsing through doing a little regex magic here to find all the different tweet IDs I mentioned. And also then just the slug of the post that I can use for, um, computing the blog post views. So all of this, which I'm able to use a feature of Next.js 12 here, which is ESM by default. So <laughs> all of the rehype and remark plugins have started to publish ESM only versions of their package, which you're looking at an ESM or an ES module import right here when it uses the import from syntax. And that all works out of the box now with Next.js 12, which is great. So this entire file is a really long winded way of me saying it generates a type safe client that I can then access inside of my files to get all my blogs, to get the type of the blog. And if you notice, I take this type and I'm able to add the type into this content such that right here where I say post, if I were to do post dot, look at that. We got some TypeScript magic. It knows the body, the publish time, the reading time, the slug, the summary, title, all that good stuff. So if I, again, if I have a typo, it complains in my editor instead of <laughs> somewhere else. So this has been working pretty good for me. I'm, I'm excited to keep trying it out. In the future, I think I might be moving this data from locally in my repository to some remote place. And it should still work uh, essentially the same way. The content layer is serving as that abstraction. Uh, maybe I'll go to like a Notion API or something now that it's it's getting a little bit more formalized there, but but we'll see. Um, and it does feel it does feel a little bit like magic. Uh, it's it's kind of nice. There's a fine line there between too much magic and like not knowing how it works under the hood and and things just working. And I think it's giving me enough of that flexibility to where I can still override it if I want to which is kind of nice. Uh, and then, yeah, my newsletter, right now, these aren't email templates. They're just straight up markdown. Um, I've moved over to review, and I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with that yet. But right now, they're just markdown templates inside of here. Um, now, this is a fun one. Maybe we'll just turn my live streams into drinking games. Drink every time Lee says solutions. There's, I'm sure there's other words that I say all the time that I don't even realize I'm saying. So just call me out if I'm like saying like or uh or something like a million times. <laughs> oh.
hopefully that was enough to explain how content layer was working in my MDX setup works. Um, I want to talk about another little fun thing, which is motion.dev. It's something that I've recently brought into my repository to do some animations. So it's it's literally motion.dev. If you want to go check it out, the library is called Motion One. It is a way to do animations with, I mean, really any type of web project because it's just using the web animations API. Um, and they have probably the best, <laughs> probably the best NPM name of NPM install motion. Uh, so if you're familiar with frame or motion, it's created by the same creator of, of that. Uh, lots of lots of good stuff here. Um, so I wanted to try this out, basically just to have an excuse to use it and learn about it. And down in my now playing down here at the bottom, I'm able to use this to animate some bars when I'm playing a song. So I can actually, um, let's see if I can trigger this. I'll just turn my turn my Spotify on. And if I click back in my browser, I got a little SWR revalidation there that pings my API and it sees that I'm now playing content. So these little uh, these little animated bars down here are through motion one that show the song that I'm currently listening to on Spotify. So let's take a look at that. Uh, I'll pull up. Spotify, or maybe it's called Now Playing. Yeah, it's called Now Playing. So inside of Now Playing, I import animate from motion. And then inside of my component, I use an effect to animate a few different things. And the three things are the different bars. There's three different bars. So for the first one, which I'm targeting by an ID, I'm doing some CSS transforms and essentially passing some properties to change the duration, how long it should repeat for, which is forever, and then whether I want it to smoothly transition in and out. And I, it's essentially the same thing for all three of those different bars. So if you look at my code, it's basically just vanilla HTML at that point. I have three spans, each with an ID, bar one, bar two, bar three, that have a little bit of Tailwind CSS to change the colors. And by using this empty array inside of use effect with React, this runs on mount. So when the component, wait, where did my camera go? <laughs> did my camera shut off? Let me uh, let me try re resetting that. But uh, it's not like anyone was watching that anyway. <laughs> They're watching the code. Uh, so I have, and I'm back. Interesting. Okay. Uh, this use effect runs on mount. So it runs when the component mounts and then tells motion one, hey, find the different bars and animate them forever. So pretty straightforward, pretty fun. Uh, yeah, it looks like my camera died, but I got it back. <laughs> thanks for thanks for calling that out in the chat. Um, I can put on some some new music here. I can put on some Crazy Frog. That's my favorite song. Um, yeah, so that's that's Motion One. That's pretty straightforward. I like it so far. I'm curious if anyone else has tried out using animation libraries and what their what their preference is or what's worked well for them. Um, I was gonna try Motion One, but given that this was brand new, I figured what a great opportunity to use this now. Um, feel free to drop any more questions in the chat. I'll get to the, the Q and a section. will probably be coming up here next. Um, I'll probably talk through a few more things before we get there. So I want to talk a little bit about my repo structure or folder structure, because I get a lot of questions about why I named things a specific way. And if there was any specific intention behind the naming of things. So let's start with the top level folders. I have pages, which this one is actually a convention of Next.js. It needs to be pages. So that is a requirement. 
But then things like library shortened to lib, components, data, layouts, these are all personal pre preferences essentially of, of how I like to structure my code. And specifically with library, the distinction I like to make is these are the different external services that I'm hooking up to or utilities that I might need. Um, I could have a separate folder for utilities, but I've, I've kind of included it all in library for now. So for example, Google, I have this uh, Google API that I'm using. So all of the code related to hook up to that instance is here. Same thing with Prisma or uh, analytics. I'm using Fathom on my site to track analytics. So I have this little use analytics hook that's all encapsulated inside of this file. Same thing with Spotify. I actually have a whole post on how I set this thing up, but it's using OAuth and I'm able to hit their API endpoint, get an access token, and then use that access token to make secured requests to the Spotify API using my credentials. Um, a common question I get with this setup is, okay, well, why did you do that setup? And why didn't you use a source folder uh, as, as seen shown here? And that's honestly, it's all personal preference. I could bucket basically all of this stuff into a source folder if I wanted. I think uh, besides Prisma, I think the Prisma stuff still needs to be at the top level. But personally, I prefer having it more explicit when I jump in, not nested between source. I think if you're doing a mono repo, um, potentially having source could be, could be nice. Um, I also have prettier set up, um, and this, this comment about prettier for file structures would be incredible. I think there is a project that, uh, there is a project that explored that. I think it was Ben Awad. Uh, I think it was called destiny. Maybe it wasn't called destiny. <laughs> this, this did not return anything. Uh, he had some. He had some library that was trying to be prettier for file structures, which I think is a really nice idea just because there's a lot of opinions here. So getting a little more convention could be good. But speaking of, of literally prettier, inside of my package JSON, down at the bottom, I have my prettier configuration. Highly recommend using prettier. If you're not, it will help standardize on how code is formatted across your repository. and just makes it easier if you have external contributors coming in, they want to make a change just such that everything looks the same and is consistent. I'd highly recommend checking that out. And it was destiny. I was right. Uh, we, we love Ben. He makes great content. So go check that out. I don't know if he's, <laughs> I don't know if he's actually going to do anything with that, but uh, yeah, we'll see. After create next app, the first thing I install is prettier. Prettier is it's it's necessary in my opinion. It helps it helps so much. Um, what else do I got in this package JSON that could be interesting? I have ESLint. This is also a very very common tool that is paired with Next.js. Basically, when I start new projects, I'm using Next, ESLint, and Prettier to help automate a lot of things. ESLint is a linter that helps you discover errors or discover issues before pushing your code to production and essentially help you do the right thing. And it's actually included by default with Next.js through an integration where if you want to opt into using it, you can. So in this instance, I'm using ESLint and specifically there is a special configuration for Next.js. So if I go to my ESLint RC file, you'll see I'm extending the next configuration and I've turned off a few of the ESLint rules that I disagree with that are maybe just personal preferences, but again, kind of comes down to your own opinion. And you can turn these off by putting a, a zero or false, or I think that it depends on the rule on how specifically you turn that off. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about formatting and syntax highlighting because it might not be obvious at first how that works. So for example, let me see if I can find a good example like this one. 
if I inspect the code here, and we look at the actual HTML that's generated, I have this code block and I'll zoom in a little bit here. There's a, let me refocus on this. Here we go. There's a pre element and it has a class name of language JSX. That JSX is inferred by how I denote it in my markdown. So if I open up my React State Management post and I find this code, you see right here, I have this JSX that I place after the markdown. This is what tells my syntax highlighter which language I'm using here. So inside of my pre, it appends that class name. And then if I expand this HTML element, in the code element, I have these different spans. And each one gets a different class name. So the Prism plugin is essentially denoting all of the different tokens or pieces of code inside of my highlight and marking them whether it's like a code line, is it a keyword, is it an operator, is it a string, all these different things that allow you to style individual parts of your code and do syntax highlighting. So you see this and you're like, okay, but like, where is the class for that? Where are the class names? How is that actually getting created? And inside my repository, if you go to the styles folder, I really only have a few configurations that I made outside of just using vanilla Tailwind CSS. And one of those is for syntax highlighting. So you see, I have this token, all of these token ones, these are all the specific colors that I've chosen to use for my syntax highlighting. And by using this at apply, I can still actually use the Tailwind colors from my design system to you know, make the symbols for uh, a number or a Boolean. In this instance, uh, we have a string here for the success and it's using the purple 500 color from my Tailwind design system. So that's that's how you connect those two here. If I wanted to change this to something else, I could I could definitely do that. Um, okay. I think we should jump into some Q and A because I know I know y'all have some questions. I've got plenty of time to answer questions about any anything y'all want. So. Package idea, Tailwind topography for syntax highlighting. Yeah, I don't think that Tailwind topography includes syntax highlighting by default, but that could be kind of nice. Uh, would make would make setup a little bit easier for, for some, some folks. How would I connect the authenticated user to the PlanetScale database? So you want to, I'm assuming what you're talking about is understanding that this person is authenticated versus non-authenticated. Um, basically, you don't want to store that type of information in a database, but what you could do is given there's a active session, then you can check, okay, there's a session for this user based on their ID. Uh, I can then successfully do some operation based on that result. Um, there's pretty much two main ways of doing that authentication. I have a post on, on authentication as well too, if you want to check that out, but you can either do sessions or JWTs um, or JOTs, depending on how you want to pronounce that. It's worth diving in a bit more. Uh, question about TypeScript safety on the back into the front. Let me see if I can find that if you want to, if you want to repost it. But TypeScript bridge question, where is this at? As you dive more into TypeScript, have you had any issues with type safety between your next endpoints and your client side TypeScript? I've relied a lot on TRPC to bridge that gap. So at least where I'm at right now, I'm not doing anything too complex to where this has been a, a major pain point for me. So I haven't hit that yet, but maybe that's something that I can explore more in the future. Um, yeah, it was kind of interesting that Go as a language ended up including a formatter by default. I feel like we're almost at a point now where 
Prettier is basically at the point where it could be included by default, but I think there's going to be a world starting pretty soon where we get the Rust based version of Prettier, which actually already exists. I think uh, I think Devin from the uh, Parson team actually created this. It's a what's it called? It's called Dprint, I think. Um, yeah, Dprint code formatter. Um, which is written in Rust. So I'd recommend checking that out. I'll drop that in the chat right now. Um, I've talked about this a little bit before. I don't really have strong opinions on, on Chakra versus Tailwind. Um, both are really great libraries. Specifically why I like Tailwind is because it's you know just CSS. It's not using CSS and JS. I think the Chakra team is exploring what a world would look like doing near or zero runtime CSS and JS, um, which gets it closer to that benefit that Tailwind provides from a performance standpoint. But yeah, Chakra's components are really good as well too. Um, <laughs> I love this because it's so true. Once you get uh, ES Lint set up in your organization, you can't just go in there and <laughs> easily turn off rules. There's There's lots of opinions and how people set up their linting setups. I've been developing C Sharp for three years and I can't decide whether I should go with .NET or explore all this new stuff. My opinion on this is if you're already in the C Sharp world, it might be easier for you to start looking at the .NET world and trying out some of that technology. It depends on what your aptitude or appetite is for learning new technology. Personally, I'm super biased towards JavaScript. I love JavaScript and TypeScript and use it for pretty much everything. So I, I spend a lot of time in these tools. Um, and I think that Next.js is valuable in that, in that regard, but ultimately it's a function of how much you want to specifically learn. I don't like giving suggestions based on only what I find valuable. It depends on, on your career journey and how you want to expand your, your learning. Um, oh, this is a good one. Mario or Sonic? I think I'm going to go with Mario. I think I'm more of a Mario guy. Back in the day, I would play, play a lot of, of, of Mario party or Mario related games. So I do like Sonic though. I feel like some of the first games I played as a kid was like Sonic on, uh, some of the early consoles, like a Sega Genesis or something. I don't even remember. <laughs> How is the Spotify player getting info in real time? Isn't this a static site? Is it using polling? That's a really good question. I will quickly pull up that code and we can talk through it. So the now playing component that I was showing earlier uh, inside of here, I have data.song URL. If this exists, then I show the song. And this data comes from SWR. So SWR is able to make a call to API slash now playing. And the way SWR works by default is that it, when I revalidate or refocus on my tab, it goes and fetches the latest information from my API endpoint. And you can set it up to do polling if you would like. You can have it poll every five seconds or every 10 seconds. But yeah, then by default, it goes to this now playing API route, which um, talks to that library folder that has this, the Spotify code here, gets that response of what's playing and essentially formats it nicely into a way that the front end expects and throws a cache control header on here too, which is a major key because we don't want to destroy my Spotify uh, rate limit if I were to call this, you know, every single time somebody hit this API route. So I can actually, and you see, I just clicked on it right there and it updated with the latest song. I can go to directly to API. Oh, I got to type it right first. Uh, Lerob.io slash API slash now playing. I don't know the name of my stuff. And here is the same exact thing from the browser. So this shows 
the song I'm listening to, which then is forwarded to my front end and is shown right here. So yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty neat. Big fan of SWR. Do I feel confident that Next.js will be the framework to stabilize the framework environment moving forward? You know, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, personally, I feel like uh, everyone's going to have their opinion on the syntactic sugar that they want to use and how they want to build their application. Some people are going to prefer Vue. Some people are going to prefer React. Some people are going to prefer Svelte. And that's OK. But hopefully, in the React space, um, Next.js can be a, a strong solution for, for people who want to use that. Best component library for Next.js. Um, I am a big fan right now of any of the libraries that are headless, meaning you can bring your own styling. Because after creating my own component library and using quite a few, ultimately, you always end up in these situations where you need to customize the styles just a little bit or potentially a lot. And you end up doing kind of undifferentiated work in rebuilding stuff that people have already done. Uh, check out Pedro's talk at Next.js.conf that just happened that was talking about, so you think you can build a dropdown. And it just talks about all the intricacies of, hey, if I want to roll my own custom dropdown, what exactly does that entail? And it's, it's actually quite a bit harder than you would think. So with a headless component library, something like uh, Radix in this instance is what he was talking about, is it gives you the underlying benefits of the, the glue or the logic, and then you bring your own styles. What challenges did you face when building the Rust-based compiler in the new Next.js? Well, first off, I didn't build it. Uh, I wish that I knew Rust good enough to build it, um, but I can give a big shout out to KDY and, and Maya on the team and the others who have contributed to working on our Rust infrastructure. I'm, I am the, the biggest noob with Rust. I am learning slowly but surely, but I have, I have a lot to learn. And I think one of the challenges was how do we distribute all of the different Rust binaries? Um, and I think we've somewhat solved this by using SWC or Speedy Web Compiler, as it's so called, inside of Next.js, which is the Rust based solution, um, as a crate, which a crate in the Rust world is the same thing as an NPM package. It's like reusing code. So we're able to use that as a crate and publish a next SWC package that is the specific transforms for Next.js. Transforms meaning code transforms. Um, essentially, when you're doing compilation, that's transforming code from one format to the other. Best practices for integrating Next.js using a serverless back in like Lambda. So. If you're using Next.js, it actually or Next.js on Vercel, it's using lambdas under the hood, uh, based on your API routes. If you are deploying on AWS um, using something like the serverless framework, they have an adapter that will convert your API routes to serverless functions, and you can also deploy Next.js on a a serverless server, if that, if that makes any sense, like an auto scaling server. So serverless in the fact that you don't have to manage scaling it or maintaining it. Um, like Google Cloud Run is one example of that. You can drop your Docker container on there with next start, and then it will handle scaling traffic for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is all for my portfolio and website. There's a lot of stuff there, but don't feel like don't feel like you need to do anything nearly that complex. Uh, my my goal with it isn't to hopefully not intimidate folks. So I, I don't want you to feel that way. But what I do want is to provide a resource for people to dive into some code and see some real examples for how you might build a little bit larger Next.js application. Like most people's blogs aren't going to need all of that stuff. Like it's, it's pretty over-engineered, let's be honest. So it's it's more of just an opportunity for me to try out Cool stuff. Do I have any recommended learning resources uh, for 
strategies or ways for self-taught developers to master Next.js in this highly moving environment. I would say check out nextjs.org slash learn. There is a couple great tutorials there and we're gonna be adding more as well. So there's kind of the Next.js basics, there's search engine optimization. We're gonna probably be doing one on just the fundamentals that you need to know as well too. So if you have suggestions for educational content, definitely let me know as well too. Uh, why is it called Next.js? That's a good question. There's actually some, uh, this is a fun little Easter egg. Um, I, I'm, this is the best of my knowledge at least, but Vercel, previously known as Zeit, which Zeit is, I, I believe it translates to time or it's German for time. Uh, I think that's the, the correct translation there, but a lot of Zeit's earlier products were actually based around the concept of time with the goal of, I want to get done. I want to get stuff done faster. So originally Vercel, the product or the deployment platform was called now because you wanted real time deployments. You wanted them to happen now. And Next.js was like, what is the, the, this is my, this is my interpretation of it. At least I wasn't at Vercel when, when Next.js was created back in 2016, but it sticks with that time theme, uh, next, you know, now, Zeit, it's like all these things that relate to time. Uh, Micro is another library that we have, which is um, MS is another one we have. There's a lot of things that relate to time. MS is for milliseconds or formatting of, of times. We really like time here for some reason. Uh, yeah, create next app prettier. That would be pretty cool. That would be great. Tailwind is like the flow state. Like once once you get used to Tailwind, there's a little bit of an, an adoption curve there where you're figuring out the the different names for the the classes. But then once you get that down, man, you can fly. You can really you can really fly writing code. Uh, Radix versus Chakra. Radix is unstyled, whereas Chakra actually includes the styles as well. So if you're trying to get off the ground really quickly, you might want to use the pre-built components that already come with something like a uh, like a chakra. But I think Radix also has some pretty good examples of Radix plus styles. So like Radix plus CSS modules or stitches, their CSS and JS library. So they're different, really. Um, yeah, very different, but they're they're both pretty good. Um, I, I did do the code walkthrough already, but this will be, as soon as I hit publish, it'll be available on my YouTube channel for you to check out. And yeah. With that, I'm probably gonna wrap things up. Thank you so much for everyone joining. I'm probably gonna do another video on my home office setup because I've had a few questions on this. I transform things a little bit for, for Next.js Comp. But uh, yeah, you even got an Easter egg here in the back for the, the Brussel keyboard. Um, yeah, let me know what questions, uh, message me on Twitter, what questions you wanna know for a follow-up one. I see a comment about Remix. I saw a comment about Shopify Hydrogen. Maybe I should do a full video on both of those, but thank you all so much for, for joining. Oh, wow, there's a lot more questions in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, Hyper, another one, uh, more, more time stuff. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of questions, okay. I'll have to do another stream to answer some of the questions that I missed, but thank you for joining live. This will be available on my YouTube after the fact and send me a message on Twitter with anything you want me to cover up in the follow-up. So thank you everyone. Hope you have a great day or night wherever you're at and I will catch you next time.